Learn more at leaderbox.com. What's the worst business decision of all time? <laughs> That's tough because there's a lot of competition. What about Napoleon selling the Louisiana territory to the United States? Eleven and a quarter million dollars was a lot of money, especially back then. Even so, it was only 22 cents an acre. How about 20th Century Fox selling George Lucas the merchandising rights to Star Wars for just $20,000? $3 billion later? That seems a little short-sighted. <laughs> In 1876, Western Union could have bought the rights to the telephone for only $100,000. They told Alexander Graham Bell he could keep his, quote, electric toy. And in 1962, Decca Records told Brian Epstein that four-piece bands with guitars were finished in the record business. So he took his clients to Parlophone, who were only too happy to sign the Beatles to a recording contract. Political and military leaders aren't exempt from blunders either. In 1812, Napoleon invaded Russia, predicting a short campaign. It was short, all right. Bitter cold forced his beleaguered army to retreat after just six months. A century later, Hitler invaded Russia. He, too, predicted a short campaign. When the German advance was stopped that same year, Hitler blamed, you guessed it, the extreme cold for his failure. Richard Nixon's decision to cover up Watergate. Kennedy supporting the Bay of Pigs invasion. The launch of New Coke. Kodak's choice to invent, then ignore, the digital camera. People make bad decisions all the time. Sure, trends are hard to read and nobody knows the future. But most bad decisions, like most car accidents, are the result of human error. In reality, there are a limited number of poor decisions. They just keep getting made over and over again. The Bay of Pigs was the result of confirmation bias. Passing up the telephone? Classic tunnel vision. Invading Russia in the winter? Again, exceptionalism. Most poor decisions don't result from a lack of courage or initiative. A great leader can have all that and still make a whopper of a mistake. Blunders are not a failure of vision. They're a failure of critical thinking. People don't make mistakes because they can't predict the future. They make errors because they don't think carefully about the present. What do you want the future to look like for your business? To answer that question, you need vision. How are you going to get there? To answer that question, you don't need to see clearly. You need to think clearly. Hi, I'm Michael Hyatt. And I'm Megan Hyatt Miller. And this is Lead to Win, our weekly podcast to help you win at work, succeed at life, and lead with confidence. And in this episode, we'll show you how to make the important choices with confidence by learning to avoid three critical errors in decision-making. As leaders, we make tough calls nearly every day. Too often, we feel rushed or pressured into choices we don't like and later regret. Today, we'll show you the bad thinking that underlies nearly every bad decision. When we're done, you'll be able to spot faulty thinking a mile away, and you'll have the confidence to make high-stakes decisions without losing a wink of sleep. Before we dive into today's show, can I ask a small favor? If you're listening to this program from our website or a link from a friend, go ahead and subscribe to Lead to Win. You can do that at iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. It's totally free. If you need a little help, go to leadto.win slash subscribe. You'll get a new episode every week packed with actionable leadership advice. Thanks so much. So we talk a lot about decision-making on this podcast. Yep. In fact, this is the first of a two-part series on making high-leverage decisions. And next week, we're going to talk about positive strategies for focusing on only the most important choices. But today, we're starting with some of the mistakes that leaders make that can create a real blunder. Yeah, and these are important because learning to spot errors is a critical skill for a couple of reasons. First, you lose more from a truly bad decision as you gain by a good one. Oh my gosh, so true. Yeah, so just think of Kodak. We mentioned them before, but they went bankrupt after ignoring digital technology. In fact, they invented it and they still ignored it. <laughs> and then in the Louisiana Purchase, France gave up the one thing you can't make more of, land. Second, most blunders result from reaction, mm. not reflection. Yep. So, for example, in episode 29, Anatomy of a Great Decision, we talked about the value of intuition. And you believe in that. I believe in that. That's an attribute of, of great leaders. Intuition is what Daniel Kahneman calls thinking fast. Mm -hmm. It's valuable, but there's limits to what your gut can do. You also need to think slow, as Kahneman also 
uh, says, and this is learning to think clearly and take your time so you avoid the big mistakes. Critical thinking gets you beyond emotional choices. So we're going to talk about three traps that leaders fall into that cause them to make bad decisions. Let's start with number one. Okay, the first one, trap number one, is what's been called the rosy scenario. And that's making all the evidence fit the decision that you've already made. So the joke in Washington, D.C. is that any government forecast that sounds too optimistic was written by rosy scenario, <laughs> right? So most leaders have a strong vision, and we know what we want to see in the future. And we have this tendency to fit every piece of new information into that vision. So this is like the classic confirmation bias totally. that we were talking about earlier. You get so wedded to the outcome that everything, even if it's contrary, somehow supports the decision right. that you've made. And so that's the thing we want to stay away from. So, for example, here's some ways that it shows up in, in business, and it might even have showed up in our business a time or two, but refusing to believe low revenue projections because you believe strongly in a product. Right. Right. So you just dismiss what the marketing team's saying. You dismiss what the sales team's saying. You know, it's full steam ahead. Damn the torpedoes. We've done that a couple of times. I remember one product that we have actually several years ago that we, it was a leadership product, one of our first times trying oh, that. I remember and, this. <laughs> and we literally sold one. one I mean, one. I know. Hundreds of thousands of people on our list. One person bought. And we were like, something what? must be broken with the, the technology. <laughs> we, we kept testing the sales page. Like, right. somehow this must not be working because right. clearly there got to be thousands of people. Can you make people. a purchase? Can I make a purchase? What's wrong? No, it was just a really bad product. <laughs> and we've all known the leader that spins every failure into a win. Yeah. You know, they're just, they got their head in the clouds. They refuse to acknowledge reality, mm -hmm. and they lose credibility with the team. They do. People don't trust leaders like that. I mean, it's right. it's great to be optimistic, but you got to temper that with realism, mm -hmm. right? So researchers at Stanford found that when you give people facts that contradict their opinions, it doesn't change their minds. It actually reinforces what they believe. They work really hard to discount or minimize facts that don't fit what they've already decided. So this is why in a political environment, you can get the same data set – and each side can use it to prop up their candidate. And the truth is, if we don't want to change our mind, we're not going to do it, which is why it's kind of futile to try to, you know, force someone into this, this place of transformation around their thinking. It just doesn't work. Well, and I think it's important to ask ourselves as leaders periodically, do I have this conclusion because of confirmation bias? Right. Or is there really something behind this that justifies the direction I'm taking the company or this campaign or this launch or whatever it is? Yes. So the question we got to ask ourselves is how can we escape confirmation bias? Mm -hmm. So you got to understand the difference between what you think and what you can prove. Yeah. And this is where I think a lot of times leaders will resort to their gut or maybe their authority or their ability to persuade. And they get everybody all worked up and all excited about a conclusion, but there's really no evidence behind it. In my experience, I've seen this as a bigger issue, not when people are trusting their gut, but when their ego is on the line. Well, that's a good point. And you got to know the difference between those two things. But I think what happens for people is they get married to something they've said publicly that they're going to do. And even after they know it's not going to work, they want to you know, proceed just to save face. Or we see it often um, in those people that we're coaching on goal setting where they get married to a strategy. You know, so yeah. they, they've kind of decided on a strategy that they want to use to get to a goal and it's not working. And they just keep trying harder, doing the same thing. Well, and we... We've really got to be careful. We could make some really bad decisions. One of the worst decisions I ever made in my life had to do with investing in a tax shelter that turned out to be fraudulent. I didn't know oh, it at the time, right. obviously. But I remember the person who sold it to me said to me, don't bother checking with your accountant Ooh. because this is one of those concepts that's so new and so <laughs> revolutionary that normal accountants won't, it's uh, so won't special. like it. And, and, and really what he was saying was he was setting me up so that even if I check with my accountant, that whatever my accountant told me right. would fit into the premise of this is so new and revolutionary, he won't get it. Right. Therefore, it's valid. Right. What's wrong with this picture? Man, well, the rule of thumb there is always listen to your banker, your <laughs> accountant, and your lawyer. I know. Those people are paid to keep you out of trouble. And it's hard. But if you don't get that second opinion, you're liable to, to make a big mistake. And that's why we all need people in our lives who we know have the ability to be objective, that are not emotionally invested in the decision you know, that we're trying to make, that can speak the truth to us and aren't kind of yes people. That's, that's right. really helpful. And I think another important point here is that we've got to be critical of our own ideas yeah. and have the ability to detach 
Right. And not so be so enmeshed in the decision that we can't be objective. And as leaders, we need to make sure we're creating a culture of dissent in our organizations where people can disagree with us publicly. You know, if we're having a, a meeting with our executive team or our leadership team, people need to be say be able to say, that's not a great idea. Or well, I have real concerns about this. Yeah. And I, and I totally agree with that point. But I think the way we say it is we want to create a culture that's safe for dissent. Right. I don't really want to create a culture of dissent. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> that's what I'm Slight, I just Slightly different. <laughs> Decision-making trap number one is the rosy scenario. We're seeing only what you want to see. So what's trap number two? I'm calling trap number two the wrong ingredient. Okay. Okay. So in what we teach, and frankly, in our practice, we always try to look for sort of the underlying principles or the ingredients in the recipe that deliver a predictable result. Sure. So in fact, we just had a recent episode. It was the one where we talked about engineering success and we said- Focus on the result you want, Right. deconstruct it, come up with the recipe, if you will, mm-hmm. and then follow the re- recipe to get the, the right result. Right. Here's the problem, is when we misidentify the ingredient that's actually causing the success. Right. So back when I was in the publishing business, and some people will remember this, some won't, but there was a huge publishing success around a book called The Prayer of Jabez. I remember that. It was a little, small kind of gift exactly. book. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Little, small gift book. It was probably, I don't know, I'm making this up, but 70 pages. Right. Really short. So publishers misidentified the ingredient that caused that success. Mm-hmm. Forgetting that it was, you know, a moment in history, that it was kind of a compelling argument whether you agreed with it's it or not. kind of an not. anomaly. It was kind of an anomaly. Right. But publishers said universally, the format was the key. A lot of gift book divisions were launched. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like if you, if you would just do these small format books, yeah. people's attention spans short. I mean, talk about confirmation bias. They came up with all these reasons yeah. why that was the ingredient that was causing the yep. result. So you saw a plethora of small books, all of which, or most of which, maybe one exception, mm-hmm. tanked. It's kind of like the whole frozen yogurt or the cupcake craze that happened, you know, about 10 years ago. It was like everybody was starting these cupcake stores and a few of them were really successful or the frozen yogurt places, but then everybody started copying it. I mean, how many of those are still around? Right. Almost none. And it, and it probably wasn't about the product. It was something maybe about the experience or something else that was happening culturally that, you know, kind of came together as an X factor, but people thought, must be that people want to eat cupcakes all the time. And as it turns out, not really. Well, that's why you've got to do your research because it's it's easy to mislabel or misidentify the right ingredients. Like we were talking about offline a moment ago, it's easy, for example, if you're trying to hire salespeople to think that the the ingredient that really determines success, that's a determinative of success, is whether they're an extrovert and an introvert. Mm-hmm. In other words, only extroverts can succeed in sales because they gotta, you know, they gotta have woo, they gotta be right. you know, glad handing, positive, upbeat people. But that's not the case. I've known some of the best salespeople I've ever known have been introverts. Yep. And so you got to be careful about misidentifying the ingredients here. Mm-hmm. It's usually black and white thinking is problematic. It is. But so be careful about the ingredients. Whenever you catch yourself saying, okay, this ingredient is essential for success, whether it's in hiring or launching a new business, you know, whatever it is. For for example, here's another one that happened in our own industry. Look, just build an online course and they will come. (laughs) But again, that's a format kind of bias. Like if you put a course online, even if it's not any good, even if there was no market for it, you'll succeed. Well, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. That had very little to do with it as it turns out. Before we return to our discussion, I want to ask you, do you know how productive you really are? If not, let me share with you a tool I use with all my coaching clients. It's called the Personal Productivity Assessment. This is a unique proprietary assessment tool that measures your current productivity levels and shows you where you can improve. Once you gain awareness over your strengths and weaknesses, you can start implementing new solutions to enhance your overall productivity. This tool has helped my top clients see where they can make the biggest productivity improvements with the least amount of effort. And with this knowledge, they're able to build new strategies for more accomplishment, more satisfaction, and yes, more free time. Look, if you're drowning in work and know you need changes, this tool is the best place to start. You can access it for free at freetofocus.com slash assessment. 
Decision-making trap number one is the rosy scenario or seeing only what you want to see. And trap number two is the wrong ingredient, which is misidentifying the reason for success. So let's move on to trap number three. Okay, trap number three is binary thinking. This is maybe like the biggest one of all. It is a huge one that leaders fall prey to so often, but it's forcing every choice into one extreme or uh, another. And it's got a lot of names, like either or thinking or the false dilemma, but it's believing that every decision is all or nothing. So for example, um, it oversimplifies every choice. Like Mm -hmm. either we invest in this new product or we go out of business. <laughs> so it's like a lot of drama around it, right? Right. Or either we meet this customer's demands or lose all our future business. By the way, I, I really fall prey to this a lot. You know, where somebody complains on social media about something that's happening in our company. And for me, it's like I, I get totally amped up and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, what have we done? This is going to ruin our company. Yeah, I catastrophize. I will say though about you, I, you while you may do that about kind of external feedback, um, I don't think you do that about decision making. And you and I actually had a conversation about this recently. We were talking about kind of the the how leadership evolves and matures over time and how when you're sort of newer to leadership, this is really a trap that you can fall into yeah. and how that changes over time. And, you know, you, you kind of develop a tolerance for the third option or more nuanced thinking. Yeah. And I think what I think I said to you at that conversation, if it's what I remember it was, I was saying that when you're at the very beginning of your organizational life, everything is binary. Everything's right. black and white. People the follow policies, <laughs> procedures. Yep. And then as you move out through the organization, then things become more gray and you have less certainty about it. And oftentimes you do have to go with your gut in those situations. Mm-hmm. But I think the key is to realize that it's rarely either or. Yeah. There's usually a third option that can reconcile whatever you're looking at. In fact, just having a conversation with somebody just as a matter of advice yesterday who was struggling because his attorneys were telling him he couldn't do a certain thing in his business. Mm-hmm. And yet, ethically, he felt compelled to do the very thing that they were forbidding. Wow. And so I said to him, I said, binary. I know, very binary. And I said, well, first of all, lawyers can tend to be a little binary in their thinking. Sure. The more mature ones, like I remember the one that we had, our general counsel at Thomas Nelson was Frank Wentworth. He was not this way at all. Right. He was not binary. But he was also very mature in his business experience. So, so he could assess the real risk, not the risk right. that was on paper. And he could balance the legal risk with the business risk. And that's yeah. what my friend was facing. Right. And I said, I would get the lawyers in a room. I would get the marketing people in a room because that was kind of the other tension that was involved yeah. in this decision. And I said, look, we got to find a third way that doesn't put inordinate risk um, on the legal side of it, mm-hmm. but at the same time allows us to do the marketing that we need to do. Right. So he liked that idea. So I haven't heard the outcome but that's how I tend to think about this stuff. Well, I often find when I'm coaching the leaders that work for us that they get stuck in this, like we all do, where they think they have only two choices and the work is really figuring out what the third choice is. And what's great about that is usually in that scenario, everybody wins. Usually in the third option, it's win-win. There's not catastrophizing that's involved in that. And the quality of your decision-making is so much better. So much better. Okay, so it's obvious in retrospect that binary thinking is not the the best kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. And yet so many leaders fall into it so often. So why do you think it's so appealing? I think that the third option is hard work. I think you have to challenge your thinking. You have to think out of the box. Um, You have to be willing to be wrong. You have to be willing to be in a place of tension of kind of like the gray between the black and the white. And that's hard, especially um, if you haven't done it a lot yet. I think once you do it, you develop a level of um, confidence and capability around it that gives you the freedom to kind of move in that space. But it's challenging. It takes a lot more work to find a creative solution than the obvious ones. Well, and I think that that's where a lot of uh, leaders value efficiency right. over effectiveness. Right. In other words, they want to get to a decision, even if it's the wrong decision. Of course, they don't think that it's going to be the wrong decision. But when you have to get in a room and hash this stuff out and you got to schedule the meeting and it's going to take some time, a lot of leaders would rather just make a decision that's more binary Mm -hmm. and um, black and white and 
get to the wrong answer, unfortunately. This is where as a leader, though, you know, if someone's coming to you with kind of a black and white decision and you don't like either option, this is where a part of the leadership development that you're responsible for with your team is to challenge them to go back to the drawing board and bring you another solution. And over time, you're really developing that in them so that they have the ability to do it without you asking. You know, maybe the way to, to look at that, and this is another metaphor, but is to shift the focus. Mm-hmm. So in other words, to pull back from the situation where you're only seeing two options mm-hmm. and see that if in your field of vision, if you widen it a little bit, maybe there's a third or a fourth or a fifth or a sixth option uh, that could be considered. Right. Like if we couldn't do either of those, then what would we do? Right. Got to ask good questions. Love that. So today we've learned that making high leverage decisions requires critical thinking, and we've learned three common decision-making traps to avoid. The rosy scenario, or seeing only what you want to see, the wrong ingredient, which is misidentifying the reason for success, and binary thinking or forcing every choice into one extreme or the other. As we close this episode, I just want to remind you that you can make high leverage decisions with confidence if you'll take the time, think it through, and learn to spot these logical fallacies. You can lead with your head as well as your heart. Dad, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, you know, I think under the general umbrella of self-awareness, that one of the things that leaders have to learn to do is to think about their thinking. Yeah. You know, this can often spell the difference between success and failure is how we're thinking about something. And so if we can get critical about our thinking and become self-aware about our thinking, it will improve our decision-making and therefore improve our results. As we close, I want to thank our sponsor, Leaderbox. It provides automated personal development in a box. Check it out at leaderbox.com. If you've enjoyed today's episode, you can get the show notes and a full transcript online at lead2.win.